family mapping has been a game changer for me when it comes to doing family therapy. If you're new to working with families and get the hang of this technique early on, you're gonna feel so much more confident and empowered when you do your work. Now, if you're already a pro at working with families, I'm pretty sure you're gonna find this tool as helpful and useful as I do. My name is Oliver and I'm a clinical director of family systems therapist here in Los Angeles and I occasionally moonlight as a professor and a teacher. The easiest way for me to explain family mapping to you is through experiential activity. So go grab pen and paper if you're gonna play along. And when you get back, do me a favor and hit subscribe so that you're the first to know whenever I put up a new family systems video. The first map that we're gonna create will be about you and me and our relationship. And the second one is gonna be based on an interaction from the movie, The Incredibles 2. At its most basic, a family map consists of boxes or squares for people, and you can use the entire space of paper for it. As far as I know, it's just you and me right now, so I've got to put two boxes somewhere on my page. Family maps represent relationships. So what I have to think about is what I know about you and our relationship, which is essentially not very much. Because we're doing this online, I don't know who you are, I don't know your name, I don't know if you know me or if you're gonna come back, it's basically anonymous. I want to capture this dynamic on a piece of paper and there's really only a few ways that I can do this. I've decided though that I'm gonna turn that disconnect between us into distance on the paper. I'm gonna put me at one end of the page and you all the way at the other. Now this distance is a representation of a lot of different things. I'm recording this in April, but you could be watching this in December. Um, so there's a sort of chronological distance that this represents. There's also geographic distance as well. I'm based in Los Angeles, but you could be, well, literally anywhere in the world. When you create a family map in a session, think about what that distance might represent to you uh, in the family. So family maps are based on your experience of the family, on your observations and what you know about them. The second aspect I want to capture in our family map is about power or influence. Now, we could argue that you have a lot of power insofar as you can turn this video off at any time and find another one. And this is true, but for the sake of the argument, let's pretend I'm the only video there is on structural family systems. And as a result, I have considerable more power or influence right now. And that's because I've got something that you want in the form of knowledge or experience. Whenever somebody's got something that the other person wants, it automatically creates differences between us. Now, on top of this, I might have more experience than you. I might have set myself up at the start as being a bit of an authority, and, or maybe I'm licensed and you're not quite licensed yet. These are all subtle differences in power or influence that need to be represented on the map to accurately portray what's going on between us. And as a result, I'm gonna actually draw you as a smaller box, and no offense here, but I'm gonna be a little bit bigger than you. Now you might disagree entirely with this and that is fantastic, totally fine and actually encouraged. Unlike genograms, which are all fact-based and data-driven, family mapping allows for more of a subjective experience to come through. So maybe you don't experience me as having more knowledge than you, in which case your diagram is gonna look different than this. The only person that this really has to make sense to is you and you probably have to be able to explain it as well. So for that reason, I love how creative family mapping is. And later in this video, I hope you get to see how useful it is as well too. So another thing that I want to capture in my diagram is boundaries. And if you're watching this, you probably have some idea that structural family therapy is kind of big on boundaries. Boundaries in a structural systems lens are in some way about rules of engagement. So a boundary around one group of people represents um, a segment of people who all have the same set of rules and what the rules of engagement are between them and people in another group. I know that's a mouthful, huh? So imagine you've paid good money to come and see me uh, in a lecture that's live. You would be in a group of people that we'd call the audience. And this audience has a set of rules imposed on them by cultural society, I guess. And it goes something like this. You agree to abide by the rules of being in the audience, and that means that you generally sit in the dark, you stay quiet, you might be able to take notes, but you're not gonna speak until um, a section in the speech opens up where you can ask questions. Those are the rules of engagement for an audience member. As a speaker, I have a whole different set of rules, and those being something like, I have to stand on the stage, I have to deliver a talk, I 
probably have to prepare this talk for you. Um, so those are the rules that separate you from me. We separate out speakers and teachers by putting them on a stage or raising them up or elevating them. And sometimes we even shine spotlights on them. Aliens visiting from another planet would be able to go, oh, that person doing the talking with the lights on him is in a different category from those people who are sat in the dark not saying as much. I am going to represent this in my visualization or my family map by the use of lines. I'm going to use double lines here to represent very clear or very harsh rigid boundaries. And I think YouTube teaching is a great example of when we'd use a rigid boundary or double boundary because I do feel very disconnected from you and there's no flow of information back and forth. So those are my double lines. Now, at some point in the future, I might do a version of this presentation in person, in which case my map is going to change. Physically, I'm going to be in the same room as them, but emotionally as well, I might feel a little bit more connected as I feel closer to people. I can see them, I can um, hear them laugh at my dumb jokes, uh, and there's going to be more interaction between us. So I'm going to change the boundary to be a little more healthy. And that is that single line right there. Now, I still have some influence or power as a teacher, somebody with experience, so I'm going to re remain above the other person, but I tend to see people as colleagues, so I think the size of the boxes are going to be more equal there. And just to show you one more example, this is what it would be like with a porous boundary. I think it would be like if you and I had decided to hang out as friends at Starbucks while I explained family mapping to you. Physically would be a lot closer, obviously, but the conversation might be um, less organized and less structured. So um, it, because of its informality, I might change our dynamic to look like that. The aliens would have a hard time knowing who the teacher was and who the student was. It's going to be harder to put a boundary there because there's no real difference between the groups. So I might put a single line or a dotted line. If you're, uh, on, if you're on pen and paper, use a dotted line. But there is no real distinction between the two subgroups. Now, I don't know about you, but my ideal way of learning would be in person. So option number two, I don't want the chaos of someone listening into my conversation at Starbucks. I, I don't really like disorganized teaching. Uh, I want things to be a bit structured and I want to be able to ask questions. You might have a different opinion about this example, but hopefully you'll agree that in general, um, there needs to be a bit of organization, a bit of hierarchy, a bit of structure and some rules when it comes to teaching at least. Now, this is exactly the same for families. To raise happy, healthy, functioning young adults, a family needs to have a bit of organization, a bit of structure and some leadership from adults. Structural Family Systems believes that when a family doesn't have these elements in place, then we start seeing dysfunction and symptoms showing up. And that is when the family comes to us for help. Salvador Mnuchin and his team had some very specific thoughts on what the structure of a family should be like. And 60 years later, it hasn't really changed that much. Although I think today we are very aware that we need to co-create the ideal hierarchy for a family and to respect cultural and religious beliefs, which is so important. So the idea that we go into a family therapy session knowing what might be best is a little jarring to some therapists, but all we're really saying is that an ideal structure for a family is going to be co-created, but we're going to have parents with more power and more authority, and we're going to have healthy boundaries between parents and kids. So what we're looking at here is a family of four, and you'll notice the parents are in a very clear subgroup, and we separate out the kids in another subgroup. This is kind of a generic ideal family structure that we'd use as a basis to go from. I want to show you two examples of what you might see when a structure is not like this. What I see in family therapy when the structure is inverted is a lot of acting out behaviors that can include anything from running away to sometimes self-harm or substance use and oppositional behaviors. These symptoms are going outwards. That's an externalizing symptom as opposed to internalizing. And for me, externalizing symptoms are always about an inverted hierarchy. The kids have too much power, too much influence, and they're ruling the house. In a sense, the kid has kicked the parents out of the parent subsystem. Another family might disclose to me that their 10-year-old sleeps in the same bed as them at night. And this might be appropriate in some cultures and some socioeconomic conditions, but generally that's not developmentally appropriate. And sure enough, 
Um, when I think of families that I've worked with, these kids often have behavioral issues as well. Families with this sort of structure and hierarchy are also going to see kids that are acting out both at home and in school. And you can imagine that this nine year old or 10 year old has left the, the kids subsystem and got into the adult group. Okay, so I think you guys are more than ready to create your own family map. So what we're going to do now is watch a scene from The Incredibles 2, where the family has come together to have dinner. I found the interactions that they have in this so realistic. It is perfect for family systems training. So if you've not got a pen and paper, go grab it now and let's create a family map based on this scene. And on the other side of the video, I'll show you what I did and you can sort of follow along and see um, how your map and my map compares. There were at least three standout moments in this clip that made me think of family systems and I could envision the family map as I was watching this. So number one, Violet asked her brother a couple of different times in a couple of different ways to wash his hands. And that made me think of her being parentified. What she was saying sounded an awful lot like what mom or dad should have been saying to her brother. At the very least, she was really bossy then. And it made me wonder if she's overstepping the mark as a teenager and stepping into the parent zone. Remember, in the real world, the family isn't able to tell us about their structure. So we have to infer it from interactions just like this. It seemed to me that Violet has a bit too much power, so she's going to be larger than others in my diagram. And I might think that she's the IP too. She's certainly the center of discussion in the clip. So I'm going to put her in the middle of my diagram. The next standout point for me was the conflict between mom and dad. Dad seems to be taking Violet's side a lot, and this is going to have to show up in my map somehow in terms of the relationship between him and Violet. Violet's basically getting dad to side with her against mom. And this is quite a common dynamic that makes me think there's an imbalance in the hierarchy. And in fact, it's sounding a bit like it's actually an alliance between Violet and dad against mom. This is a cross generational alliance. And um, it means that I'm going to put Violet closer to dad and also indicate that dad and Violet are against mom. The fact that dad didn't take mom's side in this means to me that there's some distance between mom and dad. And whenever there is too much distance between parents, boundaries between the parent subsystem and the child system become more porous. And when boundaries like this become porous, it gives Violet the ability to move up from her system into the parent zone. And as a result, she's going to have more power, she'll have more say, she'll be more bossy than she should be as a teenager. Most often when parents disagree on something or get into arguments like this in front of their teen, it gets used by the teen. And I suspect that this is something that Violet is going to exploit. She can uh, work dad in her favor against mom. If this was a dynamic going on in front of me in a session, I would tell the parents that it's really not a good idea to have that kind of conflict in front of their teenager for that very reason. So based on just two minutes of viewing a family, you can get a lot of information to put in your family map. Whenever you observe a family completing a task or just letting them talk as if you weren't there, it's considered a form of an enactment. And all that is, is really just letting the family do their thing so you can watch and observe and understand. And later on in treatment, you could interrupt and give them new ways of interacting. Whatever ideas you pull from watching family or observing a family, um, don't let them get solidified in your mind as a fact yet. I consider all of my ideas to be a hypothesis and I'd be looking to prove or disprove things over time. So when you compare the family map I just created to the ideal version of the family map and put the two side by side, you actually get an outline of what is going to be your treatment plan. Because essentially what we're saying is that this ideal family, this perfect version of our family hierarchy is the goal of treatment. And the treatment plan then is all of the steps that we need to take to get there. Let me give you an idea of what the treatment plan might look like just based on these two versions of the map. So number one would be about modifying the role of the IP. I'm getting Violet to be less central in the family. I want her to be the right size and I would get mum and dad to stop letting her be parent number three. 
One of the structural techniques I would use at this point would be to block or restrain Violet from acting like a parent in front of me in a session. And I would try and get mom and dad to notice what I was doing and explain why. So they were empowered to be more parental when I'm not around. Number two, clarify boundaries. There's a lot of porous boundaries going on here. The parent conflict needs to be addressed as I suspect that that is really not helping um, that boundaries between the parent system and the child system. Mum and dad need to have some pretty big discussions um, away from the kids uh, so that they can get on the same page about things. I would tell them that arguing in front of the kids about topics like this disempowers them from being leaders and actually empowers Violet to be the boss of the household. Number three is enmeshment. I've I've got to toughen dad up a little bit and get him more comfortable setting limits with Violet. They feel a bit enmeshed. There's actually empirical evidence out there in some of the work that Chloe Modanes has done. She's one of my favorite structural writers. And uh, she was looking at substance users in residential treatment center and found like something crazy like 80% of people in a residential treatment had this set up, had a cross-generational coalition in their own family of origin. And if you think about it, there's a really confusing message being sent to these kids. They're being told that they're a child by one parent and uh, told that they're an adult or a co-parent by another. These are two overwhelmingly confusing messages to receive from parents. I hope that gave you some insight into family mapping and how I use it. And if you want to know more, hit subscribe, join the mailing list, download the PDF, and I'll do my best to keep these videos coming for you. Feel free to leave me comments or questions below and I'll do my best to answer them too.